Peace and love, everyone. I'm Andrew Houston, and I'm here with David Davidja Buckland, uh, the author of Our Natural Potential, and oh, someone that I feel is a, um, a, a profoundly important um, influence in the, in the spiritual community right now. He writes extensively about the stages of enlightenment, and provides a very clear and comprehensive understanding of the unfoldment in the context of daily life. This is something that I, I truly value, and so I'm grateful to be here with David. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time to talk with me for a little while. So I'm going to see if we can find some commonality in the, the different language that we use. David speaks from more of a Vedic context. I believe that the conceptual framework for the seven stages of enlightenment arises from the Yoga Vaishishta yes. and the work of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Is this uh, yes, I, I, I studied in that uh, many, many years ago, yes. It's, uh, okay. So right. yes, that's, that's kind of my, my base concept, con okay. context, yeah. Beautiful, all right. And uh, the, the language that I use has arisen just spontaneously um, through what has unfolded here and what I feel is appropriate um, for those that I'm speaking to, to, to provide clarity and a conceptual framework for the process as it unfolds. I came across David's work last year and was really impressed to see the commonality in what we were speaking about and how he had laid everything out. And uh, it was something that was a joy to find because I did not see it anywhere else in the spiritual marketplace. So uh, the basic terminology is much different. I use, I do not use any Sanskrit terminology. And when David does, he clarifies what that means and what it's pointing to. But, hmm. There's part still of the nuances, yeah. I saw back yeah. to do Sanskrit because the word there isn't really an English word for it, and so right. I have kind of like like sattva, for example, I translate as purity or clarity, but it's there really isn't an English word for it. So right. it's kind of a yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's you know as I've started to read some of the ancient texts and and uh, become familiar with Sanskrit. Uh, to the degree that I could, I could see what certain words were pointing to and what they were encapsulating as far as a given level and things like that. But I also uh, can see where different teachers use the same word, the same Sanskrit word, to use different to me, to point to different things. Very different. And so yes. that was part of the part of the reason that I don't use that so much in the teaching here. But I feel that if it is well clarified, it is an extremely valuable tool. Um, so yes, there's there's a there's an inventor named uh, R. Buckminster Fuller. Um, he, he developed the, the geodesic dome and, and uh, talked about the geometry of 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 thinking in mm -hmm. his book Synergetics. And one of his principles was if the word in English didn't have an exact meaning, he would. Uh, create another word to replace it so that he could only communicate exact meanings. But it, <laughs> it, meant, it meant his uh, reading his material it was a little thick <laughs> to learn all this language. <laughs> yes, I have several, um, several people, I've had several people make comments about the language that I use, but I still feel that yes. a lot of it is free from conceptual baggage. And that adds for even if they do have to really dig in and discover what the word means or what it's pointing to, that that adds, adds to the clarity. So. Yes, and whereas I'm using language, which, which has a lots of baggage sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're being that. very clear about, about its nature in the context of your teaching, and I really appreciate that. So Thanks. David describes seven stages of enlightenment, starting with uh, self-realization, which is essentially just a shift into what he would refer to, I believe, as a silent observer. Uh, one realizes himself as the inner witness of all forms uh, I, and phenomena. 
I do uh, yeah. just that slightly because uh, for some people that's kind of how it unfolds. Mm -hmm. uh, but for some people, they shift into a witness before self-realization. Yes, so it's kind of like the observer wakes up, and and, and you're you're kind of live kind of step back a little bit, and you're kind of observing your life and and what's happening, and you're not making claim to you know I am doing this and this is my idea and this is I did you know all the me my kind of dynamics start to fall away but there's another stage in there where that observer has to wake up to itself and that's right. where self-realization is where self realizes itself I mean and sometimes there's a that's kind of a muddier area sometimes for people and, and they can kind of get confused on what self-realization is and that's and thank that's you so much for clarifying that david sure. that's that's so beautiful because that was also the case here there was a a clear witnessing presence even in the, the presence of an identification with the body still yes same here so um so yes yeah, self-realization is shifting clearly into the field of observing itself or the field of witnessing yeah. itself and the, and the self knows itself Yes, self realization. Self aware yeah. that yeah. it is itself, right? Yeah. Yes, right. Beautiful. Yeah. So, and then he goes on to describe the stage of God consciousness. Yes. And this is a more refined value of the initial shift. Yes, there's kind of, um, you could say, two aspects to the process. And the, the second aspect is a little bit less recognized in the West uh, because we have a more mental orientation and so on. But essentially, there's a, there's several stages in consciousness, and then there are several stages in refinement of the of perception and the, the means of, of of knowing and and the awakening heart. Sort of, it's kind of like the masculine and feminine sides of, of the process. So the the God consciousness process relates to the the the, the refinement part of it and the awakening heart. Um, they're kind of they can be in a kind of linear way, uh, but they can also be out of sync, so to speak. Um, some people, for example, start to unfold refined perception long before they wake up, and they can actually get quite developed in that arena. Uh, a lot of energy healers, for example, and, and uh, things like that, uh, have more refined perception. People who talk about, you know, angels and and uh, higher beings and that kind of thing. Uh, those are a form of uh, refined perception, or people who can look inside the body and um, and see the organs and and uh, the energy and this kind of thing. Um, those are variations of that. Um, and so that process can start before awakening, but it may not start until well afterwards. It, it's kind of more about the process of refinement and, and purification. And it depends on the kind of techniques the person is engaged in and the kind of life they have. Um, it's also cumulative from prior lifetimes too. So we don't all start from the same starting point in, in this life. Right. Uh, both in, in terms of development of consciousness and uh, development of, of refinement. So um, some people go into a God consciousness phase after they wake up. So there's um, uh, that refinement and, and, and so on. And some people skip that and go on to the next stage. Um, and then the God consciousness comes later. Um, uh, but one way of, of uh, another way it's talked about, like Ajashanti, uh, he's a, a, a Zen American. Uh, who study in the Zen tradition, um, he talks about head, heart, gut. So mm -hmm. essentially, uh, head is is the the self-realization, the, the shift from from being a me to recognizing the self. Um, uh, so there's a let, letting go of the, the the concept of a me, you could say, the the, the idea of us and, and all the stories and stuff around that that collapsed with the with the first shift. Um, some right away and some over time, and then there's a descent to the heart. Um, from a Kundalini standpoint, they talk about the Kundalini Shakti rising to the crown and awakening, and then a descent, uh, sort of a Shiva Shakti joining Shiva and the two descending together through awakening, and then the God consciousness at the heart, and then uh, unity, the gut, the next stage. So it, there's a lot of variation. And there, there's, you know, when, when I studied it uh, with Maharishi, he talked about uh, just three, the first three stages uh, primarily, and then later on talked about more. And uh, at that time, it was like this and this and this. It's just like really simple, structured, something people could understand. But mm -hmm. now it, there's a lot of people where, for, for which this is unfolding. And then there's this huge variation in how it's actually unfolding. Like we, we mentioned earlier about some people have a witness before they wake up and some people don't. Um, and just there's little nuances. And so 
it can get confusing because it's not, you know, for somebody witnessing, it kind of sounds like that they're awake by a lot of the description, but but they actually don't know the self yet. They, they, the self is kind of awake, but not to itself. And it sounds like a, you know, almost like a, um, a uh, what's the word, the terminology, uh, being picky about, about wording or something, but it's actually a huge difference in experience. <laughs> so it, uh, uh, it's an important nuance. It is important, yes. I appreciate your, your clarification there, because I have seen, I know of many cases right now where there is a, a clear recognition of um, a witnessing presence of there, there's a recognition of a field um, that is present yet they have not realized the self has not realized that it is itself there yeah. so there there's still an identification that is present that feels like it is um, aware of a field yes yeah Exactly. And, and that's what that's the way that things unfolded here. So I do understand that um, that that can be an important phase of development as well. Yes, yeah. and and it's it's and it's, it can be really valuable because you have that period of time where you're uh, an observer and and you're a little more detached. There's still and then you're more conscious of the ego dynamics and you're kind of able to wind some of that down. But of course, then you kind of get into this thing where the ego tries to manipulate the experience. And I don't know mm-hmm. if is that like, like in yours, but I remember at a certain point that I realized that the ego was using memories of spiritual experiences to pretend to be the self and mm. would create these conflicts with, with itself. And, and it's like, how am I ever going to see through that? You know, but then yeah. I, at a certain point I realized it, it wasn't the, 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 I, the, the me, I, the, that was going to see through it. It's itself that wakes up to itself. Right. Yes. That's, I had never heard of the self when this was going on here. So I had, yeah. I had no uh, context for it in that sense. I, uh, equated it with the presence of God, yeah, because yes. that's what it that's what it felt like uh, to Andrew at that point. Yeah. And so well, that that's point's still, that point's a little more refinement there already too. That you recognize that that is for some people what what can lead the God consciousness process is that they wake up, they realize that I'm not the doer, that it was just the ego claiming to be doing that. That uh, it kind of and you can kind of see it at a certain point. It was sometimes with the witnessing where something happens and then you go like. And then the ego kind of goes like, oh, I did that. This was my idea. <laughs> right, <laughs> I, just, right. I just need to feel in control. And, and, uh, and, and yeah, it's quite, it's quite uh, convoluted and, and bizarre when you kind of become more conscious of that, that uh, dynamic. Yes, beautiful. So I, I describe the, the shifts a little bit differently. The way that I describe it also includes the masculine and the feminine. I refer to two aspects of the field of subjectivity. and there's a shift either into one of these two aspects. So one aspect will be dominant and the other will not be recognized in its fullness yet. And so I describe the two aspects as either pure awareness, which I would consider a, the masculine aspect, yes. or conscious presence, which I would consider the feminine aspect of the field. Right. It's like, and, it's like the, silent, the silent observer and the more lively uh, yes. fullness. I mean, yes, it's and, that's, that and that's where you get power into, to to observe itself. That, right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's no. There's no. There was no Shiva without Shakti, or Shiva. That's Shiva right. is dead. Yeah. yeah <laughs> without Shakti, because consciousness can't know itself without that aliveness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, lost the point I was going to make. Sorry. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. One of the things to to understand the refinement too is because you have this. We were talking about pure consciousness or pure awareness at those deep levels. And then we have the surface of life with with the um, uh, you know physical world, our emotions, our, our thoughts and minds. But there's these layers kind of between that, uh, between the, the silence and the lively consciousness and 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 the the surface layers. And that's what the refinement is about: becoming more conscious of, of those things. Just like some people um, are unconscious of their emotions, they have emotional responses and that kind of stuff. But for the most part, they're paying no attention to that at all. Or they're repressing them, or, or whatever. And with a little bit of of, um, of noticing, uh, then mindfulness, however you want to word that, they can uh, they become a lot more conscious of, of what how they're feeling and, and what what's going on with their emotions. And in the same kind of way, as, as the perception refines, you become aware of of the, these fine mechanics of of the mind and the the intellect and the and the fine feelings and and, and this inner. So energetics and you know people talk about the chakras and all those kinds of things. 
Um, so that's kind of the arena of the the the, the middle range <laughs> that, that could come online. Yes, very important as well. I, you know, the way things unfolded here, there wasn't really a lot of spiritual information that pointed to those subtle levels. So it was it was something that was very familiar. You know, the this shift into into seeing that I was this infinite field, and and it wasn't something that. Um, seemed strange at all. Uh, seemed, uh, you know, it was, it was like duh, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that with a lot of people waking up. One of the first things that they often notice is like, why didn't I get this before? This is so simple. It's so obvious. And it's like I've always been it already. So right. like, how can I be so clueless? Because it's right there. It's pretty normal. You know. It's, it's yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then, as a lot of those. Um, the awareness of a lot of those finer mechanics started to shine forth and you know this consciousness was becoming more familiar with itself and and the way that it was appearing in form and and all of that it that also seemed very familiar so i didn't equate it with refined perception actually right. until i um came across your work and i heard you speaking about refined perception i didn't even know that that was something that could be absent but I would be watching some different teachers and I recognized that there was a few things missing, you know, just, just in watching some YouTube videos. Yeah. So on the, flip, the flip side of that, of course, is myself who studied this stuff in great detail, but when it actually started to unfold, I had to throw out all my concepts because there was something <laughs> off with most of it. And then kind of bring it back in, in, in terms of the new context. Cause, cause there's just like, just, uh, you know, mental garbage that had gotten caught up in there. Right, it's not like, supposed to be this way. <laughs> yeah. I, I get emails on a pretty regular basis from people wanting wanting to escape their lives by waking up and wanting to know you know how to how to get enlightened instantly by escaping their lives and that's kind of like running away from because enlightenment right. is your life. It's that's it's right in your life. It's yeah, you should say you don't want to be enlightened because all of that stuff is going to be boom, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, then there's no escape because then it's like it's right. you're more conscious. So what are you more conscious of? Oh, oh, what you haven't dealt with yet. That's exactly right. Buckle up, you know. I mean, <laughs> there's those. I, it's always interesting to to see how those, you know, in the immediate blossoming forth of a of a contextual shift and the total recontextualization of what we what we had previously taken to be reality in ourself. You know, there is that period where it is very much so prevailing uh, that it kind of perhaps doesn't allow for a lot of that material to come up yet. But I found that once it settles down, then the process of surfacing begins. And, and, and that's such an important uh, process. And as, as we begin to work with that material as it arises and, and really resolve it intelligently or allow for it to be resolved intelligently, then that fullness comes comes back with a greater uh, a greater intensity. Yes, and learning how to do that too. Yes, so so many layers important. of that. Just you know, uh, uh, like I talk about uh, energy healing, for example, fairly regularly on my blog now. But back at that time, it was off the page. It wasn't something mm -hmm. I paid any attention to. But just when, but as as I became aware of those uh, those energies and where I was kind of like contracted and and uh, or in aversion or, or, or whatever, and those inner dynamics, becoming conscious of those, and then learning to be okay with it, and then and allowing that to be processed and complete. Or some of the old uh, stories, you know, these, these old things from childhood even, that, that would, yeah. were running little programs that would be triggered by certain experiences in life, and, in the, and now they're coming up more consciously, and it's like, what? <laughs> this is I believe that, <laughs> and then once they're seen, you know they can be resolved. But uh, it's, it's there can be quite a uh, an unpacking that goes on. Yes. 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 I found that you know the the fuller that the condition becomes, and the brighter the brighter that the light of divinity becomes, then the more it shines into the depths of those unconscious layers. Yes. And it's it's almost like that. You know, by the time we get to the space where we see something that was very, very deep, the condition is such that it's able to support that. It's able to yes. support that healing. It's able to support that resolution. And it, and if it had come up at a, at an earlier stage, it would it would probably 
we probably would not have been able to really be with it in the way that we are when it arises. Right, I agree. Uh, there's that that uh, being able to allow it to be as it is, so that it mm -hmm. can be. Because so often it's just like it's the end of a traumatic experience or something that was very difficult for us in some way that was never quite completed. We put it at the time; it was a big thing. We put part of it aside to deal with later, and then never came back to it. And so now it's coming up to be to be finished. And really, uh, you know, some for some of that stuff, I found that I just had to sit with it for a moment, and it would just wash over me. In a wave of of energy and emotion, and it's done. Mm. And, and sometimes it'd be like a huge weight came off, or just like oh, and a real a real relief. Uh, but yeah, th there was no way that could have happened <laughs> when I was uh, younger, just because it was so entangled with who I thought I was and the self story and all that kind of uh, uh, nonsense. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes, that's beautiful. <laughs> I've also found the daily uh, writing practice extremely helpful. You know, I, writing has taken place every day here since the initial shift, uh, essentially. There was a period of time where it stopped as part of uh, a, an offering it back, like a surrendering it, um, because I noticed a subtle reliance that was there um, and kind of a, a conditioned habitual tendency to to want to inventory something and investigate it on paper uh, when it arose. And so I recognized that also as a limitation or it was recognized within the field of conscious awareness. So another, another way to control kind of. Right, right. So that was the, but that was at a pretty advanced space. So <laughs> I do feel that it's, that it's very valuable um, to have some sort of a, a daily investigation practice where we can really start to, to see what's taking place with with a with a great degree of clarity from a bird's eye view and and we're not trying to process it necessarily just within you know within the mind or within our cognitive uh, experiencing in that way yeah i agree it's it's a yeah it's a whole process and it still surprises me what comes up and and there's a, a <laughs> tendency i think you'll 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 see this also that, that there's a tendency at, at a certain point um, we'll get into it perhaps further on when we get into the later stages, but as we become more and more part of the wholeness, uh, we move more and more past a lot of the personal stuff, uh, and then we start basically processing the collective. Yes. So it, it doesn't really uh, end or anything of that, in that kind of sense. Uh, no, but we But we have a, we become more effective <laughs> over time, I guess you could say. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I found it's a, you know that the intelligence really um, finds its own way. You know, oftentimes it's not it's not something that necessarily needs to be learned, but having a having a basic framework or an understanding and a recognition that it is a process, and that even in higher stages there there is still surfacing, there is still resolving that's taking place, there is still healing that's taking place is so important because that is really um, confirming and validating if someone is going through that and and their condition is one that is exquisite yet all of this stuff is coming up and it may seem you know contradictory or conflictual and it's and it's really not so yeah. and it's really important to understand those dynamics too because sometimes you see that with with people they wake up and they think oh I'm supposed to be a teacher because I have some some knowledge now and they start teaching right away and then they start dumping on their students and, and they have their old concept, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to be perfected now and fear of problems and they may be teaching that. And uh, yeah, anyways, you, you can create kind of messes and stuff. So really understanding that, you know, the dynamics is, is very, very helpful. Uh, and because there's, there is that understanding of consciousness in many ways in a lot of tradition, but the, the purification and, and cleaning part is, is not always present. Right. Yes. And it's, and it can get pretty heavy sometimes too. You know, I, I've noticed that um, as the nervous system it really becomes fine tuned, you might say, and, yes. and is able to hand, handle a greater degree of power and, and divine presence and, and bliss, that also allows for some pretty large, what I would call energetic condensations to come up just some some seemingly yeah. gridlocked energy or fragmented energy 
and it comes up and and you can get put on freeze mode you know sometimes when it comes up because of the intensity of it um but i've found that you know by the time that 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 kind of material is coming up for resolution the body is well equipped you know one's condition is well you know well stabilized able to handle that and yeah. you know there's a there's a capacity to really allow that in a way that is efficient and effective and it's quite remarkable the capacity that can develop actually to mm. because we become you know an, uh, that that wholeness that that allness and so you know coping with some aspect of a personal trauma within the context of everything is is not really a, a big issue there's still you know there's still the challenge of working past some you know because we can have had a you know uh, decades of habit of keeping a lid on that stuff and just being able to let that go and allow that to surface and, and so on um, yeah it can be a little bit of a process but it's still it's there's no problem handling that in the in the when the container gets big enough Right. Yeah, you can't remember it when it's gone. <laughs> I can't. It's like, yeah. well, I, you know, I it's like a vague recall of some something that really froze you up. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a I have a, a, a journaling habit myself, but I don't, I don't do, sort of do an everyday kind of a thing, but rather as it comes up. But it usually happens yeah. a couple of times a week, just as new things open up or or new things are seen and are understood. And yeah, and and it just. Running it down kind of makes a little bit more uh, uh, clear and, and can kind of help resolve or, or clarify uh, what's going on. So it yeah. does. That's why that's part of the reason I brought that up because I was on your website the other day and I read where you you did value a daily. You know, your writing was very helpful in the unfoldment. And so, I, yes, I, what I actually yeah. publish is kind of a different different style of thing. Um, right. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's an interesting process in itself too because sometimes what's happening. Is I'm running for, for the world and not for myself in that context. It, the other stuff comes out that I didn't even know. It's just kind of in this process of trying to formulate it in words, and just other you know stuff will just flow right out. It's, it's kind of nice. It still surprises me that I can actually communicate some of this stuff. It's, it, uh, it's not a skill I thought I had, but it just arose. Um, I did want to loop back a little bit, uh, explain why why it's called uh, God consciousness. Hmm. Because um, there is this process in there with the perception refining and becoming aware of those subtler dynamics. Um, it's kind of like we, we can become uh, aware of, of what might be called the hand of God or, or that, that divine influence uh, uh, you, you've also referenced in there. Uh, those, mm, well, flows, that's kind of more, a little comes later. But, uh, but there's that falling away of the individual ego claiming uh, claiming that I did this and so on like that, and and so the question can come up: Okay, what? So what is doing this? Mm. What is what? Where, you know, where does this world come from? What's what's motivating motivating me to do these various things? And you can sort of see dynamics. And part of the refinement is getting to know the the um, uh, the laws of nature and and how how the world functions. Those kind of mechanics. Um, but even you know, and then behind that, there's there's kind of the, the deeper divine aspect. Now, there's an idea that, that comes out of the Vedic tradition also uh, that I find really useful. Uh, they refer to it as the personal and the impersonal, and it's a little bit like the masculine and the feminine all the way around. Um, but um, but it's not quite the same thing. But essentially, it's like the impersonal is kind of uh, looking to the world. Uh, with the intellect, uh, and, and we see the world as a functioning uh, laws of nature, uh, a mechanical process, and, and um, systems, consciousness as a function, and so on like that. It's kind of the, the, the way you see philosophers talking in that kind of drier, um, uh, the scientific method kind of approach, the more objective approach. And then there's the, the personal, where we experience uh, more from the heart. Uh, more from the fine feelings, uh, and it's actually the same level of functioning um, in the in terms of those those layers between the, the surface and, and consciousness, but it's 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 approached from that that different that you know from the heart rather than from the intellect, and um, and in that in the in the uh, from the personal perspective, those same principles 
uh, we, 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 we ex can explore with the intellect, we can explore um, as embodied, essentially, um, as those laws of nature have a, have a, a, a personality, uh, a form. Um, it's because it's a, on a subtle level, that form is kind of amorphous and they, there's come some, there's variation in how that appears. It's kind of like an analogy you might think of as like in dream state when you're, when you're having a dream and, and somebody shows up a certain way and then they change it into their thing, whatever. It's, it's kind of a very uh, pliable or, or, you know, dependent. And, and our, our um, culture, our expectations, that kind of thing have a strong influence on, on you know, how that, how the how those kind of things show up, and so if we're not comfortable with that, and it's like oh that's kind of weird, you know, um, then we're going to be more inclined to to have an impersonal approach to how we experience the world and and see it in terms of principles. Uh, but if we're open to that, then then we're uh, going to be going to have another means of knowing, basically, in a more subjective means, and and it's useful to recognize that influence of you know them choosing how they should, how they appear to us or our influence on our expectations on how they appear and, and this kind of thing. Um, so the appearances are, are kind of mirage or, uh, you know, they're just appearances. Uh, but if we can look be not behind that into, into the dynamic, then there's the, the, there's the potential to have a relationship with the laws of nature. Um, an example that uh, comes to mind, um, for example, I was in a plane, I was having a plane flight one time. And it became quite windy out, and the the uh, the plane was kind of you know you know going going for a ride, a roller coaster, uh, with the wind. And so I tuned into the wind uh, davis, and they were you know, basically moving the wind around, and and had a conversation with them. And they kind of you know in this case they were kind of like a little grumpy because it was my job, you know whatever I'm going to do my job here. And, and but have a little you know polite conversation and treat them with respect and and they moved on and then the plane settled down and, and I was able to enjoy it so it's kind of like the, there's a, there's those advantages to be able to investigate uh, and and communicate on that level um, but from from you know my experience it's it's mostly too much information so for the most part I spend my life in the more impersonal mode because otherwise it's just you know where we're surrounded by life and everything, you know, the, the, the flowers and trees have, have, have uh, you know, uh, Davis, however you want to describe them, who are responsible for managing those, those things. And, and, you know, they're available to communicate with, but, you know, you don't want to be, uh, uh, you know, the, get, get the too much information thing too often. <laughs> so it's, yeah. for, for, you have to function in the world, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful, I'm, I'm glad that you brought this up. Uh, you know, the way things unfolded here was in, a, in more of an unpersonal unfoldment. There is still a high degree of refined, uh, refined perception and refinement. And, uh, you know, it was very much recognized as divinity sort of revealing itself to itself every, every step of the way, except for some, what I would call some high negation conditions that arose, uh, you know, later on. But the... I had never heard of, you know, the possibility of these aspects of myself uh, being recognized as embodied or, or personified. Yeah. And uh, I moved to an ashram where this was this was the, their um, their number one understanding. You know, this is oh, okay. they, well, they operated they that's operated less, on that personal level. That's less common, yeah. So it's, yes, uh, and yeah. Uh, and so in that. In that environment, it was very interesting because a, a lot of spiritual positions were surfacing, and there was, you know, a, a, it was a very, very constructive time. A lot of, a lot of refinement actually was taking place there because there were some subtle positions that were present I wasn't aware of, and uh, being in that environment allowed for those to to come to the surface and for them to be recognized, and being introduced to that understanding and then coming across your work um, allowed for that recognition to, to unfold with a, with a greater clarity. And, and for me, for me the, the, the way it showed up was starting to see them and uh, it's like, oh, what is this? I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know about this. And, 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 you know, kind of pushing it out. And then finally, well, higher beings started showing up and, and I was kind of having the same kind of 
a hands you know uh, arms length thing and and so finally there was a little process of 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 acceptance and but also I recognize the need for for uh, discrimination uh, mm -hmm. because there are there are beings who you know, higher beings uh, what might you know what we call angels or light beings whatever like that whose job is to you know uh, keep things running and, and help uh, growth and evolution and so on. Um, but there are also um, beings who uh, you might say have kind of stepped off their their path and they're not engaging with their, their journey. And so they're kind of more, um, uh, I don't know, the criminal yeah. element, not quite the right word, but they're kind of more manipulators and wanting to, to mess around and, and, and cause trouble. So, you know, and being able, you know, and being able to distinguish between these 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 kinds of, of being became really important because so, I've seen that sometimes people start to become aware of this and they oh it's a subtle being it must be perfect and 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 good and, <laughs> and they get they get kind of manipulation and stuff going on so there's it is useful to have some understanding about that arena particularly the difference between the the more surface types of beings um, and and uh, and more subtle ones that are that are divine in nature. Because there's sort of the there's people when people are between lifetimes, uh, you know that they're in that kind of more surface area, and some of those people have a kind of a, a role as as guides and, and supportive for us. But it's it's more mixed. It's like on 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 you know on physical in physical world that there's kind of a mixture. There most people are fine, but there's a few that are more problematic and and so on. Uh, whereas the, the subtler beings are are. Uh, yes, I've I've found that that which I would describe as lower astral um, are those that would attempt to sort of distract or disrupt the process. And that has, that has very much been a part of the unfoldment here. Um, I've encountered those situations, but being well equipped with the knowledge that that was a potentiality allowed exactly. for its immediate recognition. And, exactly. and I feel like it's, you know, it's a very common understanding in all traditions that there is that sort of testing that takes place yeah. uh, on the way up. You know, it's not just a, a smooth ride, you know, with all rainbows and just blissful butterflies and everything the whole way. Um, yeah. So <laughs> we have, to have some discernment is extremely helpful. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and, and one of the key ways, by the way, with discernment is the feeling value. Mm. Uh, because the, the, the higher beings that, that, that their, the feeling value is is much higher, and whereas the the more manipulative beings are just there's kind of um, it's a, more, a little more mixed and you know heavier and so on. Yeah. Yes. So that discrimination through feeling perhaps appealing to an aspect of ourselves that isn't you know isn't quite resolved yet that that yeah. has to do with yeah. some of the lower chakras or something like that. Yeah. Are they appealing to our higher nature or, or to our <laughs> days? Yeah. 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 Or are they offering a Faustian deal? <laughs> yeah. Yes, all right, beautiful, very important. And another, I'll tell a, a quick story. After I read your book, I remembered you uh, writing about that story with the wind, Davis. So my wife and I uh, moved into an apartment and, and when we moved in, we started to notice that in the bedroom there were fleas. So we were like, oh no, you know. It's, and I wasn't too upset about it really, but she, you know, we, we needed to do something about it. And uh, so we started talking and she was planning to get some, you know, chemicals to get them out and everything. And I said, well, just hold on a sec. I'm going to um, just try something else. And so I, um, I had a conversation with the aspect of intelligence that presides over um, the fleas. And, uh, <laughs> and, in two days, they were gone. Yeah, they were gone. So yeah, it was, a friend uh, of mine, it was, a friend of mine had a similar thing with birds. This massive flock of birds and ended up in his backyard and stuck around for several days, and they were crapping on everything and that. And uh, and so yeah, so he appealed to their to their deva and and, uh, and with respect and, and yeah, and yes, moved off to the forest. Yeah, and reverence. Yes, that's uh, something that I should probably mention that this is something that is very much within the self and it is yourself and yes. you're speaking to an aspect of yourself. So yes. this is something that is totally subjectively verifiable. You can, you can taste uh, this as a reality for yourself and the intellect oftentimes dismisses these kinds of things and, 
you know, is very, very uncomfortable when, when these uh, conversations come up. But it's important to recognize that it is, it is a very real possibility in the unfoldment of enlightenment. Yeah, and it's not it's not that it's something we should chase or 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 that it's spiritually important, but it's important to, to recognize that it's there so that when it does unfold, then it's it's natural. Uh, you you recognize what it is and you you can kind of discriminate and so on. And so at the at the finest value of that of of God consciousness, we can become aware of the divine itself in, a, in an embodied kind of way. Um, and so uh, they talk about the. Uh, Ishta Devata in the Vedic tradition, which basically means your personal form of God. And sometimes those are carried in India through the uh, family tradition and, and so on. Uh, but essentially it's that uh, those qualities of the divine that we most relate with uh, that can, can be embodied. Embodiment of love, the embodiment of power, the embodiment of, of knowledge, however, you know, what, whatever those kind of uh, uh, fundamental, um, fundamental uh, you know natures we most would uh, relate to of course how that shows up for you is going to vary widely when I when I first had my uh, an experience of a divine being I found it a little confusing because of course again I had this this concept of the the personal god so I thought was this guy supposed to be my personal god I'm not responding that way <laughs> I'm kind of like oh what's this <laughs> yeah that came later <laughs> uh, but it's still, it's like, it's essentially kind of like God in the field, God in within the the the, 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 the within creation, within uh, the expressed value. So it's kind of the 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 first way we might come come to God uh, as a form, or whatever, God a God as a uh, to experience God directly and through through a form. That's kind of the first okay. first step. having that. Uh a relationship value that's present there. Yeah, and there's some form, yeah. So there's 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 a two-ness there. So there's a relationship and and there's uh, able to be, you know, uh, as I mentioned, there, there's that value of the awakening heart that can take place in that phase. Um, uh, so there's, uh, so God may be a way for that to take place. Uh, however, it might also, be, you know, you may find it easier to flow love to your guru or your teacher or whatever, or to your, your uh, your marriage partner, or your your partner, whatever the, the, they call that, the uh, um, uh, forget. Anyways, there's a term for that. <laughs> it's on my blog. <laughs> but yeah, it's basically where, where where is it easiest for you to flow love to? So it's not going to just be into some form of God or whatever. It can whatever wherever love wants to go. Yes, beautiful. So I want to just circle back to something that you said about this not being um, something to chase after or to to really have some sort of motivation towards necessarily and to to recognize that this can take place without a full unfoldment of enlightenment you know? yes. and also to see that um, a full unfoldment of enlightenment can take place without um, the, the more personified uh, value shining forth. Right. By the time that you know this was heard of here, the pure divinity was already uh, re shining forth in its brilliance and um, was very, very uh, intense and, and strong. Right. Perhaps not well uh, integrated yet, but it was. Yes, <laughs> it's my, one of the things that they talk about in, in the old text is that you have to realize the self before you can realize God, and, and partly mm -hmm. part of that is because to know God, you have to know who you are on, on that level. But it's also because knowing the self and oops, knowing um, you know the container, um, uh, then you have a platform on which you can know God, because God is, is so much more than everything so it's <laughs> so and, and even there knowing god it, it, uh, often comes in stages uh, as I, I you know qualified there a little bit about you know in god consciousness it's it's god in within creation as a form as a as a separate thing we relate to and that right. can go through further i mean you mentioned pure divinity for example this is it's kind of like uh you can compare uh pure consciousness at the you know at the, at the ground state of our experience with the surface of life and in the same kind of way, it's like the surface, the surface of appearance of God, uh, God as a form with certain qualities, 
is the surface of that, and it has a lot more depth. It can go back into the into pure divinity. Yes. Further along. Further along. <laughs> That's right. So perhaps we'll touch on some of that development then, and uh, see if we can okay. find some clarity there. I was I was having a conversation earlier with someone, and something that came up was pointing to the fact that you know, speaking about beyond consciousness or um, what you would refer to as Brahman, uh, Brahman consciousness, and then uh, para-Brahman or pure divinity, and then what I would refer to as a, uh, a non-experiential source condition, which I would either call the void or pure divinity. And so those are the, the two ways in which I contextualize that source condition where that are, that is a that, that is what is dominant. No longer is the field of subjectivity dominant as our sense of what we are, but the source of the field of subjectivity is what is dominant as the sense of what we are. Right. And how we can't shift from, uh, we cannot shift into that unless there is an identification with the field of subjectivity. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, so the way, the way I, I, I frame it is the, the third stage is, is called unity. And essentially, in, the, in self-realization, we've been experiencing being consciousness observing the outside world. And essentially, uh, they talk about sometimes about the refinement of perception taking place until you come to the finest relative and you come to consciousness itself and, and then realize that, that consciousness um, uh, is behind all experience. It's kind of like this, the movie screen on which all experience is taking place. So it's kind of here looking out, but it's also here looking back. And the whole world is kind of looking back at you in a kind of a way, and uh, the, the the dynamic of the subject and object. And uh, but oftentimes in the current in the West and so on, uh, people are are not going through that refinement process quite that far. So, that, but there is that tendency at some point for there to be a recognition that there of that kind of screen of consciousness, so to speak, or that 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 we're. Uh, we're both the subject and the object. Mm -hmm. And so there's a recognition that I, you know, it's like I am that, and then uh, all this is that. Kind of a, a thing to, an anglicized version of the Upanishads. <laughs> um, but essentially that, that we wake up to the self as the objects of experience as well, and the two become one. So there's a unification that takes place. And then, um, uh, then there's a whole series of sub-stages, essentially, where, where that, uh, the, the series of just by living life, we recognize that, oh, I'm that too, and I'm that too, and I'm that too, and, and, and it kind of all becomes, it moves back into our memory, and, and you know, and past and the future, and, and, you know, distant parts of the galaxy beyond our ability to perceive, and all, sort of all these layers that they talk about in the text. But essentially, the, the, there's a growing, um, the Brahma Sutra calls it the aggregate, there's a growing wholeness that gets bigger and bigger and bigger just by experiencing life and and, and uh, going through that process and more and more gets integrated into that one wholeness. Um, and, and so the greater and greater uh, unity, so to speak. Um, and then that if there's been a God consciousness phase before that, that refinement process, um, that kind of gets reset as we, we made to make a major change because who we are shifts and the self then becomes all of it. Uh, and, uh, and so then uh, once unity is well established, then the refinement process, which had already been going on, now comes back in that new context. Now for some people, it's kind of like a seamless process. Uh, the refinement just kind of continues into the new stage. And some people, there's kind of a break, and then it kind of restarts. Um, for me, for example, there was this whole history of, of inner experiences um, that have been going on from long before I woke up. And um, uh, all that disappeared when I had the unity shift. It was kind of odd that way, but it's sort of like the whole thing just kind of vanished. <laughs> and it, but it kind of reset. And then uh, and, and as unity was, was, was um, established, then all those previous things came back again in that new context as aspects of the self. Um, yeah, so there's kind of, so that's the, you know, so the third and the fourth uh, 
yeah, um, stages is, is the unity shift, and then, um, and then, um, and then uh, refined unity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and the 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 Upanishads, they're they're in the text. Um, they're kind of like uh readers digest versions of, of some of the other Vedas. They're kind of like extractions of uh, shorter stories and things that are profound. They tend to be some of it's about self-realization, but it tends to be more about unity. Uh, a lot of that. There's a bit of muddiness in in modern non-dual circles kind of mushing the two together. Um, and some of the texts even refer to um, it all is one thing. Uh, Brahman and, and unity and, and oh, it's all one thing, which is true from one experience, <laughs> but from a prior stage, it's, they're still separate. There's still, there's a process, but once you're, you know, once you, you know, you're, you're further along then that all your previous stuff is included. And so it's true, <laughs> it's true for yeah. that stage, but it's not actually true before that. So it's kind of that, that, and that's one of the key things about these stages is, is the reality of each stage is distinct. Mm. Like in, um, Self-realization, and the way we're talking about it here, uh, where you're the the observer and there's a separate world, is dvaita duality. It, there's a there's a two-ness, and uh, there's a and there's a distinct separation going on. In unity, you get the beginnings of of, of oneness or or non-duality. That's when it actually begins to unfold. But true non-duality really uh, doesn't begin until Brahman, because um, what Kind of what happens in that process of unity you go through this greater and greater um, inclusivity and unity and it depends on the process different some people just go flying through that and <laughs> don't go through too much of, uh, and then some people are a little bit less like i'm kind of analytical so i'm kind of well, what's what you know what happened now what's this well <laughs> uh, yeah what, for, one, for me one of the things that made me really much more relaxed about um what's real or true kind of a thing, because it kept shifting. Uh, the reality was kind of, it wasn't like the old thing was lost and anything came each time, but there was this progressive um, increasing of uh, what was included. And, um, and so it would shift uh, the sense of reality a little bit again. And, and the physiology, the, all the layers of physiology between consciousness and the surface all have to adjust to these changes. Um, and uh, the subtler levels are very pliable and flexible, and they can adjust fairly really easily. But as you get up into the structural levels, and then and then into the um, uh, uh, more, you know, the lower chakras, we put it, or the more more uh, physical uh, into the emotional and physical worlds, kind of thing. Uh, there's there, there's kind of the slowest to catch up. They uh, they take a while. Uh, and not in, in terms of the unpacking we were talking about earlier purification that takes place but in terms of of the uh, of this the physiology and everything catching up to that that uh, yeah it's it's some of it's can be pretty big uh, changes into our you know sense of ourself and, and then the na our relationship with the world how we see the world uh, each in each of these major uh, uh, stages changes I mean I mean if you talk about um, God in, in many circles today, uh, usually it's a debate about whether you don't believe in God, whether you do believe in God, or whether you're kind of agnostic and you're in the middle somewhere. But those are just essentially mental debates, you yeah. know, belief. But when you directly experience God, it's it's a whole different thing. And it really yeah. then belief really is kind of irrelevant. Um, you know, somebody asks, you know, I, I remember having this discussion, somebody asked me if I believed in God, and it was sort of like, do I believe in strawberries, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, 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 when I first started giving talks, I would always say, you know, I'd be in front of a, a group that was um, more religiously oriented, <laughs> and I was, you know, things were well underway by that point, but I would say, you know, I don't believe in God. <laughs> And I was giving a spiritual talk on, in a, within a limited context. And, uh, you, you know, you see some of these, it, it, I used to say, it'd be like uh, if you were in the swimming pool and it's someone asking you, do you believe in water? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah it's that's, that's, that's even a better analogy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's, a, it's a silly notion uh, because yeah. of the... It's the direct experience. Yeah. And, and really, and, and in, in many ways, there is that, that aspect I mentioned before about our, our beliefs do have a, a tendency to influence uh, how we experience them. Mm 
mm. if we expect you know Jesus and, and to be a certain form or, or Krishna or something like that um, that's going to have an influence on how they uh, show up to some degree but that's not the same thing as belief and, and um, with, it doesn't re well if we refuse to believe refuse to accept the idea that it could be a, a you could you could experience God in form then that can be an impediment to the, the experience yes. um, but um, but we're talking experience here not not um, not belief it's it's that's an important uh, distinction and uh, on that that note, I, I'll point out that I've I've actually tasted uh, refined perception within the context of of all of the traditions that I've been exposed to, interestingly enough, prior to even hearing about uh, refined perception as an actual uh, part of the process. You know, when I was, when I was reading uh, some of the Kabbalistic literature that I was reading, I was able to perceive the, the sephiro, the manifestation of the, the, these points of emergence. Um, and, and just sitting down at the kitchen table one day, I saw them, um, and that was spontaneous, you know, I'd never, yeah. and, and then also with the Christian context was able to, to, to perceive on some level the value of angelic presences and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth in a Buddhist context and in more of a, um, a devotional uh, Vedanta context as well. So, right. yeah. Right, yeah, there's a diversity. Yeah, for me, there's this kind of gamut, the angels mm -hmm. and archangels and stuff, but, and Jesus and, well, more Christ than Jesus, really. Yeah. Um, and and then there's various Eastern figures, and and uh, one guy who showed up uh, gave me a Persian name. It took me a while to figure that one out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a Persian background, so. Uh, <laughs> so was Zoroast all, Zoroastrianism, I think, right? <laughs> yeah. No, oh, that's yeah. That was a that was big there for a long time. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh but yeah it's kind of a there's a whole mixture it's it's and there's you know different cultures will emphasize different aspects uh or different uh appear you know forms but but um but there's it's 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 universal at those subtler levels it's universal we share it all and so mm. it's it's all there basically yes yeah it's just amazing right yeah and at a certain coming back around to unity again so at a certain point um there's various ways that you can frame it, but but for example, here, what happened was the self became aware of itself in a, in a kind of completion. So consciousness became aware of itself globally and at every point within itself, where each of those points is a is a an experience, an experience, a potential experiencer. So you know, your point, I have a point, and everybody listening is a point, kind of a thing. Um, and there is a recognition at that point that I'd always been looking in on myself, the self, I mean, the cosmic self had always been looking in on itself. And I turned and looked behind, basically. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's not quite the right way of putting it, but it's sort of like that that's how it showed up here. And, um, and so then there was a, you know, at, 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 in unity, there's the experience is that consciousness is infinite, eternal, boundless, includes everything. And even God, it's totality. You know, there, there's no, there's no uh, idea that there's more or, or something beyond that. It's kind of like a goofy idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, but then with the Brahman shift, you recognize that there's something greater than that, and and it actually has the source of consciousness in it, the the fundamental qualities that give rise to consciousness in the first place. So that it can become self-aware and create all the other stuff that happens. And um, and there's there's various ways that can happen. Um, the Brahman shift. Uh, there isn't a lot of names for it in the in the, in traditions because uh, it's not as commonly talked about. Partly because it's it's a little you know how do you talk about that unless you understand all the other stuff before it kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. And there's these subtle differences because I mean, you for, for example, you talked about the void, but the void implies space and it, you know like an emptiness when consciousness has has this kind of when it self or consciousness has this kind of uh, spatial quality uh and, and some people talk about emptiness or they all talk about fullness which is kind of fullness and emptiness ways of experiencing consciousness but brahman is is something else 
what you were going to say. I was going to say yes. I've I've heard you mention that before about like language like the void and emptiness, and I'm I'm pretty clear about about it when I describe it. Um, that the the void in the way I present it is an actual contextual condition, which includes the presentation of phenomenal reality as part of of as part of the way that it's being presented. Yeah. So there's another contextual modality, which is what I call the, the levels of enlightenment that I refer to called source awareness, right. where there's unmanifest source and manifest conscious awareness. You know? right. So that would probably be closer to what I would say, perhaps the initial, the initial phases of Brahman would be. But when I describe the void, I'm talking about a, a total dominance um, of that qualityless nothingness or supreme nothingness right. in a way that it devours all of creation. And I, I refer to that as the void, not pointing to the fact that um, the totality of uh, reality is recognized to be a void, but pointing to the fact that phenomenal reality is recognized as void. In that right. sense, yes. Right. So I'm I'm appreciative of you being very specific like that because I am as well. Yeah. And I, and I do understand that there can be discrepancies in the languaging. And and it's, I was it's, kind of, and there's subtle differences, and it's so easy to confuse because there's things like like with waking up, there can be a a um, uh, sometimes people experience a, a waking up into an emptiness, mm -hmm. and sometimes there's an experience of waking up into a fullness. And they're the same thing. And yet, waking up to the void or, or, or waking up to the space of consciousness is not the same thing as waking up to the, the, the nothing beyond consciousness. And, it's, and that's, yeah, it gets, and there's like, they're completely different things where, where they sound kind of similar and the other things sound completely different than they're actually the same thing, <laughs> different, right. different versions of experience. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky territory to talk about. And Brahman, even within the text itself, it's, it's rarely understood properly. And because sometimes people will use Brahman for everything, which, I mean, it is on, on that one level. The Brahman is an interesting one. They call it the, the, um, the great awakening. Mm -hmm. uh, Brahman means great. Um, and it's essentially, you're waking up from your enlightenment <laughs> to that point, because uh, it's completely, uh, it's a complete shift. Uh, sometimes people go through a, a kind of a drier period uh, mm -hmm. after, after going through all this fullness, especially if there's been a refined unity stage where there's all this refinement of perception and, and seeing the dynamics of creation and all, all you know, the, the play of the, of the divine and all this stuff going on. And then, you know, it's like the whole thing is, is thrown out. And yet, you know, I remember, I remember an experience shortly after the shift where, where I'm standing on this deck and, and I, I know there's nothing there. Like there's no world, there's nothing. It was never even created in the first place. Not that it's an illusion. It's never even there in the first place. And yet there it was. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like had a, cause there was, cause I'd had some perception of the world as an illusion before. It's a little bit like a mirage kind of a thing laid over, you know, consciousness or the subtle uh, dynamics. But in this case, it was like, it wasn't, there was the no, the knowing that it wasn't even there. And yet there was this kind of, uh, and it had a, I don't know, shimmering, I'm not even sure how to describe it, that it would differentiate it, but, but it had this quality that was, it became, was kind of different. Now, I haven't thought about this for a while. Um, <laughs> I described it as uh, mist-like almost mist like it was yeah. almost like a um an infinitely peaceful mist was collapsing within its own nothingness uh, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it has this and then there's the kind of flows of consciousness too that were that with refined that's another thing with, with refined unity you become aware of the way consciousness attention flows and and that flow uh creates in its wake and so to speak and, and uh creates effects and a lot of destroyers as well. Um, whereas this was kind of like flow, but a, a, a profoundly more subtle version of that. Yeah, so it kind of, you know, it's been interesting to watch people uh, or talk to people who have had the Brahman shift because the, the, it shows up in a number of different ways.
Yeah. Um, like here, there was a really flat period. I was in grad school at the time and, and really, really busy. It was a express program. So it was like classes six days a week and, and all this. And uh, there wasn't much time to just sit with it. And uh, so it, it was kind of like just this really flat period for, for a, a year or so until I had time to sit with it and, and, uh, and process it more and more. Um, a friend of mine had this process where they kind of stepped through the door a little bit and then pulled back. And step through the door, a bit. <laughs> and, then, and then finally they stepped through the door and, and let go, um, and uh, they brought the refinement with them. Mm. So there, there wasn't a, a, a sense of, of loss that there can sometimes be. Um, of course, that's a temporary because, because we, you know, seen, uh, um, you know, once you, because it's kind of like this two-stage process. First stage is, is the, there can be the experience, and this varies, but there can be the experience that is dominated by what's been lost what's what's not there because mm -hmm. what is there is is nothing so what do you what how you know by comparison you every, everything to nothing you know and so there, there can be a sense of, of uh, loss and then as what's there because it requires a much subtler uh value of knowing um and it's not consciousness that knows it it's brahman that knows itself mm -hmm. And so it's a becoming familiar with what Brahman is and, and or how we want to call that. Um, and, um, and, you know, and then there's a, there can be a refined process again, but it's not a, re, and, but now it's not a refined process and a refined Brahman, uh, because there's no thing. And so it's, it's, it, but there's this kind of, uh, refinement of knowing, I don't know, it's, it's hard to describe. Uh, but there's there's but there's a refined value that can kick in where where those those values can become known, and then and then pure divinity uh, shows up. <laughs> so like so, Brahman is this big reality, and then pure divinity or para Brahman, so it's beyond even Brahman. Um, and like Brahman is like sets the stage so you can know pure divinity because um, from consciousness there's too much there's too much filter, too much stuff there to to know that because it's so profoundly refined. And um, and it um, yeah, I mean, how do you describe it? It's it's, yeah. it's uh, the way that I've uh, been contextualizing that these days is that in in the void or um, what there's a, there's a difference in the language there, but yeah. uh, let me make one more point about that because. It, in source awareness, there's a recognition of the unmanifest source and the manifest self as the right. field of subjectivity or conscious awareness. Yeah? Right. And, um, but the, the, the unmanifest source is not dominant yet. So I, I make a distinction between those two contextual conditions and I've seen this unfold. Yeah. Um, but in the void, what I refer to as the void as a contextual condition of reality, it, there's a what appears to be the disappearance of the self yes yes so that is the that's what i would refer to just so we're very clear and the listener is clear that we're kind of we are talking about something very similar yes uh, oh yeah, yeah. No, i agree i agree I, yeah. i'm not hearing, hearing any disagreement here just i mean we can it's, it's more like explaining language because it's kind of like how do you it's right. it's like yeah. i mentioned earlier it's like it's things that seem really similar but they're actually very distinct and 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 so there's a lot of misunderstanding about this. And the reason why I mentioned earlier that that Brahman is real non-duality is because even there's it turns out it's not recognized when you're in with in the, in the self or in consciousness. But when you go beyond that, you recognize that even consciousness itself has these subtle dualities of existing versus not existing and conscious versus not conscious, and 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 all that collapses in in, in Brahman. And so mm -hmm. it's just you know totality is one way it's been described as well yes um as it's inclusive it's not and that's the other thing where, whereas in the stages and this kind of varies by person a little bit too but in the stages before that there was you know you were awake and then they were dead then it was you know gc or consciousness and then unity each of them kind of had their own realities that were somewhat exclusive but one of the things about brahman is, is that it's it's is this huge value of inclusiveness and mm -hmm. so it becomes inclusive of, of those prior stages. And I mean, we joked about not remembering what it was like to be you know, self-realization um, uh, earlier because it's so, uh, you know, it, 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 cause it's not been the reality for a while, but the, um, but at the same time, there's still, it's still included within that, 
uh, within Brahman. Um, yeah. It's it's sort of massively inclusive kind of a thing, and yet it's not. It's it's the, the our, our irony. You have to go to nothing to become every, to to become more than everything. And and I wrote the ironic thing from the from the perspective of para Brahman or pure divinity. I, I now even see the reality of Brahman is kind of like the afterglow of of, of uh, divinity because it's yes it's, that was the, that was the point I was getting to is that the way yeah. I've been kind of contextualizing that is that in shifting into the void or or Brahman as a as a total all encompassing supreme pristine nothingness as reality. Uh, it's making room for the recognition that pure divinity is actually reality. <laughs> so I look at it more as like it's it's like a preparation, uh, and yes. uh, you know it's been it's been interesting kind of cognizing the dynamics of that and um, seeing you know different perspectives on how that would how that would unfold. And it's interesting that you call it an afterglow because here recently I've had this recognition that. Um, I've been contextualizing it a little differently than you do as far as the unfoldment of, of uh, creation in, in the self, that Brahman or the void is an apparent withdrawal of pure divinity within itself, which creates the presentation of supreme nothingness. So it, it's like pure divinity starts a phase by first forgetting itself, so that it can remember itself as many. Oh, and that has to take place through the shining forth of the self and the progressive stratification of individuation within the self ad infinitum. So uh, it's interesting that you call it an afterglow because I recently have cognized that as a uh, potentiality or possibility for the way- that, That's a really interesting uh, way to contextualize it. Yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. Because you know, you'll, you'll, hmm? you'll probably appreciate this too. I, there's a concept in, um, Kabbalah called Sim Tsum, and it's actually called creative withdrawal. And what they refer to as Ein Sof, which is the closest to pure divinity that I can really find in most of the scriptures, is God as infinity beyond anything like nothingness or manifest levels. Ein Sof withdraws itself or appears to withdraw itself to itself, and it creates this infinite space of its apparent absence but because it's a withdrawal of pure divinity it's it is recognized as realer <laughs> than the self when it when we arrive at it right right yes <laughs> right. wow beautiful yeah so like just turning the lights off real quick in a room just yeah. but that leaves that afterglow yeah. of darkness of the apparent absence and then that's when all the dynamics start to unfold and so that's that i look at the primary distinction you know i used to look at it shiva shakti or you know awareness and uh, conscious presence and that and that is still a level but even brahman atman would be the primary distinction which allows for for the unfoldment of all of this you know yeah <laughs> well it's interesting too how, how stuff gets recontextualized because um you know, because there was this thing of of consciousness coming to know itself through the this you know self interacting, self aware consciousness, uh, creating a creation so that it could know itself, um, and then it's kind of like from the context of of Brahman, it became kind of like its consciousness trying to imitate in, in a kind of way, create a, create a facsimile, um, and it, it's like a pale imitation of 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 pure divinity. And when we're talking, I mean, when I talk about the word, I use the word creation just for context. It's kind of like um, uh, it's almost, it's like the mind of God in a kind of a sense. Yes. The, the um, and within within that are multiple creations, each completely different than ours. And within ours is multiple universes. And we we live within one universe, and there, and then we know from science can kind I of get a sense of how vast our universe is. So I mean, this is a really, really big place, and yet it turns out so you're not like, talking about the creation of this planet <laughs> yeah, only. Yeah, yeah. It's like the, the whole this whole giant uh, process, and 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 but from that uh, from that perspective, it's like it's like just a thought. 
a single, and, and this has to be a pretty complex one. I mean, some of the other creations are much simpler. And I, I found exploring a few of those interesting because they, they embody certain ideas um, uh, easier or better because they were, they were, um, because uh, it was simpler, so you could understand the dynamics of space and time, and and that in that context without all the other stuff in there. Uh, so we have to have a, a complex one, but it still comes down to just being a thought. And uh, and it's yeah, like, I like that. I was thinking about that when I when that revealed itself uh, about your contextualization of it as a brief musing. So I could yeah. see that creative withdrawal as part of the the brief musing because it that is the way in which you know this this dream of divinity is is un, is appearing to unfold by that very process and right and yet there's this this dynamic of the divine knowing it all all at once like it has this brief thought it's all known it's done right um but there is this profound degree of detail that's possible and so by creating all these points of, you know, uh, awareness within itself, uh, well, there's all these different perspectives, and there's the ability to unfold all the detail, and bring out all the all the little nuances and the detail that that are not in a, just a quick thought. Um, right. that, it, that there's this kind of, and it's a bit like our own experience. We have some idea that, oh, I'd like to, you know, go on a holiday to Florida, you know. Um, it's just like an idea goes by and it's done, right? But then there's, you know, then there's a whole process that can go where you, you know, plan and you book your tickets and you actually, or you drive down there or whatever um, uh, context, and 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 then you have to have the experiences there and 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 then come home. So there's a there's kind of like those two levels of a thought and then going in and actually having the experience and and uh, and filling it out. Um, right. And so there's a sense, uh, there's a, that sense of the purpose of all this is is for experience to unfold in, and you have the idea of of uh, dharma in, in India, that, or uh, often translated to mean purpose, but the word means that which sustains. So it's essentially there's a dynamic that sustains the world in this in this appearance, uh, so that ex we can have these experiences and unfold our our, our you know our, our lives and and uh, and and uh, play our role in the whole. Uh, to bring out this little detail or that little detail or however. Yes, I've seen. You know, these days it, the way that it kind of come comes through here is the, the unfoldment of the potential for for love and the flow of love and varying degrees, of the apparent absence. Of the expression of the love of pure divinity, and and how. Sure how all of that fits together in, you know, in the infinite intricate web of uh, creation that doesn't have a beginning or an ending. And also right. could be seen as not actually taking place. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and it's not, and it's sort of that you, you get these philosophical debates about, oh, the world's an illusion, or the world's, the world's Leela, the divine play, or the world's real, or whatever. And, and you know, as physical, philosophical arguments, but they're actually uh, all valid perspectives uh, and, and that can come up at certain stages in the journey. Um, that's another whole, whole topic. But um, uh, they're, they're, they're different perspectives of reality and it's, 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 it's like the, the reality is inclusive. So it's, they're all true in, in a certain context and, and for a certain purpose. And yes. uh, yeah, so it kind of, uh, um, not, there's not that say that everything is true or anything is true, but, but, but there, there is well, a, a subjectively it it feels true in that sense so that's one of the i'm glad you're bringing this up because it's important um, for us to understand that the nature of subjectivity by virtue of what conscious awareness is what it takes itself to be or holds in mind can appear to be real and valid and true that's right. why we feel like we're a person and we, we have our own life oh, yeah. and, and and but I think that you know that principle applies to everything, even the the various recognitions of itself as a field, and the different qualitative channels that that unfold there. Right, and there's also the other value there where 
you step out of that and you you experience yourself as not being this person and not even having a person in, in some contexts. But again, uh, enlightenment is a movement to inclusivity. And mm -hmm. so at a certain point you recognize, oh yeah, there's still a person there. I still need this to take care of this body mind and uh, <laughs> need to address anything that comes up and, and I need to actually feed it and, and, uh, and so on. And, uh, and, and so I have that balance thing, because there can be some tendency I've seen in, in some people, and, and including teachers, to say there's no person, and then get into a, a in kind of some kind of denial, and then they kind of, they'll do stupid things or say stupid things, because there's no person there. They don't see a person in front of them either, and so they say something really obnoxious or a little too, <laughs> a little too cutting, and, and, and uh, it's like, well, you know, you still, you want to you be, still want to be, uh, polite and, and well it's yourself yeah. you know that's another thing so, <laughs> but that's the yeah that's an interesting point you're making as well that when i because sometimes i do point out those things depending on it's all very contextual according to the listener you know what i mean because at a certain degree of ripeness it's valid and at other points it's not different things like that yeah. so it, it arises spontaneously there's no planning or designing or anything <laughs> but, um you know one thing i've noticed is that it, it, it always is contextualized with the word separate. So there, there is no separate person, but there is this, this persona, this personification, this, yeah. this value of you know, expression, which allows for us to, to, to be together in this experience. Yeah, and there's still those karmas unfolding. And so even though somebody might be very, very <laughs> awake, the momentum that brought them into this life and the, and the, the past dynamics are still playing out and through their lives. And that gets resolved more and more through time. I found it really interesting to notice certain certain dynamics that were very present in my life for a long time have, have wound down, and it, so they no they no longer come up. And it was, when that first started happening, it was a it was a big surprise because uh, it just kind of you're just so used to certain kinds of people respond in a certain way to certain things and blah blah blah. Just that's the pattern in this life, and gradually those things have been um, winding down. But yeah. there's certainly definitely still in play other ones. <laughs> so it, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, I, I totally resonate with that as well. I, I, I just want to go back to the to the no person thing really quick because I think it's right. so important what you're saying. Yes. Uh, the other day I was uh, giving a talk and I said, you know, it's kind of like if a duck were to hatch out of an egg, and all of its attention was focused on the fact that it wasn't an egg. And so it was just totally enraptured with the fact that it realized that it wasn't the egg, and it went around and told all the other ducks that they're not the, that they're not the egg, right? <laughs> <laughs> or tried to talk to the eggs and tell them that they're not that they're not the egg, right? Yeah. It, it hasn't realized that it's a duck yet, and that it can fly, and you know that it has feathers and all of that good stuff. Right. So I thought that was pretty funny because I yeah. I remember that phase, you know, and I probably would have told somebody, you're there's no person, you're not a person, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it, but it was kind of a childhood adolescence, uh, you know, from a realization perspective. Yeah, that, there was a there was a funny period for me uh, as I was approaching the unity shift. Um, for me, it, it happened in a couple of steps, and one of the steps was a falling away of what I refer to as the core identity or the or the the core thing that drove a sense of of David. So even though the the ego had been blown off the top with awakening, um, there were and the and the uh, emotional drivers of that because of the self-concepts, emotional drivers of that uh, cleared um, to a large part. Uh, and then, then I got down to the, the, uh, the core identity, kind of, I jokingly referred to those early on as the, the three amigos, am egos. It's got to let, so kind of like three levels of functioning of the, the, the ego. Um, and when that last one popped, the, the, the sense of, of David uh, became meaningless and and I stopped using personal pronouns for, for uh, <laughs> yeah. a, few, a couple of weeks in there because it just was meaningless to say he or whatever. And the, the uh, uh, friends, that was around the time that Prince had, had done his thing where he stopped, he was a symbol instead of a name or whatever. And, and so uh, a couple of friends were jokingly calling me a person formerly known as David. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. And that's, uh, you know, that's like super annoying to everybody you're around too. <laughs> using personal pronouns and it's like, you know, come on. Yeah, but there's still there's still these little aspects of that though here and there. Like when I, when I was writing the book, uh, when I was there, you know that I I wasn't going to include personal stuff in there, but they kind of pushed, you know, friends and said, no, you have to include that in there to to as an example and and to show you're qualified to talk about this stuff. 
And so I was using the word here as a personal pronoun. You know, yeah, so I said here, da, 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 da. <laughs> and I still do it a bit, but my, my editor was like, no, 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 you can't do that. <laughs> So you know, so there's like using the word the, the word I was like that was sort of dumb, but but then at a certain point it's like you're, you're out there in, in the normal world and and you know if you don't use normal pronouns that people don't understand you. Yeah, yeah, I found that it's it, it's very much you know according to the context and what's appropriate that it yeah. just arises and it's very natural. It's not something that we have to force or think about or you yeah. know because thought kind of you know really <laughs> settles down in a certain sense so um it, it it arises as it's needed and in certain contexts i may refer to i may speak as i and i'm speaking from an identification with with divinity but that's very you know in the moment in the in the teaching in the flow of teaching and yeah. it, it's only when that is appropriate and yeah. and not at other times yeah because yeah, you still have to communicate yeah. yeah. So there's no point in using language if you're not planning to communicate. <laughs> yeah, it's worth making making a comment here too in this context because um, we've we've come through a period of time and and uh, uh, and the, the kind of consciousness moves in these large rising and falling cycles. Uh, they call that the yugas in India. Uh, the Greeks and so on have talked about that in terms of the ages, and there's these basically uh, cycles of rising and falling consciousness. And uh, we've, we've, we're rising out of a, a dark age. And uh, in a dark age, it become, became one of those things where, where the renunciate approach became quite dominant in, in, a lot, in spiritual cultures, uh, both East and West. And uh, a lot of that is still very uh, present in, in, uh, in the teachings. And so there's this emphasis on, on uh, renunciation and withdrawal from the world and and if you're going to be a monk uh you know ignoring the person is perfect perfectly normal thing mm -hmm. uh, to, to do but most of us are, are householders and so in the, in the modern context uh, we still have to function in the world and communicate with with everybody and and so on so we have to talk like a normal person to some degree <laughs> important um, yeah, but yeah and it's the same with practices we, we don't uh, adopting a, a practices or philosophies that are that are uh, unsuitable for for your lifestyle can be can create uh, divisions and, and yeah there'll be conflict you know I've run up yeah. against uh, plenty of that in in the unfoldment yeah. here just from you know kind of a some Buddhist karma and things like that and 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 being in the midst of daily life and kind of running into these subtle positions about the way things were unfolding and as you know as far as the body and everything like that. And, and having to resolve a lot of that, so it, it's important to have that understanding. Yes, I found uh, uh, in for me and during the unity stage, there was there was a, a lot of really subtle, uh, what I refer to as shoulds and musts, that were mm -hmm. there that just unconscious programs that would run, and you know that oh you're supposed to eat a certain way and you're supposed to behave a certain way and and all this kind right. of stuff, and it all just fell away, and, and and it's it just it's been really interesting because because then you just when, when those things fall away, then you really are just driven by the more subtle movement, um, the flows of consciousness and so on. And, and so, you know, like this, this beard, it's, uh, there wasn't sort of a process of like, oh, I should grow a beard now and, and making a plan and, and timing it. It just simply, I stopped shaving. There was no thought about it. And then it was, after a few days, it's kind of like, oh, I'm not shaving anymore. Okay, that's interesting. So what's happening here? And and so they're apparently I'm shifting back to having a beard again, so <laughs> and it's kind of like that. There there's there's a falling away of all these uh, expectations and, and rules. Um, that's even actually more so in the Brahmin stage too. I, I've I've watched a number of people. Uh, they 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 sort of had a certain practice that they did at a certain time of day and all this kind of thing. And and you know now they they do their their program meditation program in the middle of the night. It's just Every night they go to bed, sleep for a few hours, get up, do their program, and go back to bed again. And that's that's what they do. It just that's what arose, and that's what they do. Uh, and uh, you know, and there's all kinds of variations that the, the people become. And it's interesting too if you look at at uh, the uh, many of the great sages from history. They were really unique personalities. They were mm -hmm. very distinctive personalities. And it's like that when the feather the fetters of of you know self expectation fall away. We become more and more distinct, even though we're more and more 
united and and, and one that the, the the laws of nature that are here that are are, are playing out this this uh, life um, uh, be, are are freed and and are able to express more fully and, and uh, yeah yeah that's right the love starts yeah. to reflect through the persona and through the expression and with a great degree of brilliance and it's it's an amazing yes. amazing process so. beautiful beautiful thank you so much um, for speaking with me I, I know we could continue to go on for a while there's a lot to talk about and, you know how this unfolds and in, in relationship to family that we're around and you know ways to approach that and to be with that and so perhaps we can do another talk sometime and, and, okay. and touch yeah. on some of those things right uh, but for today i feel like we've covered a lot and yes we have <laughs> more than i expected <laughs> it's, it's been beautiful so thank you yeah. so much oh, you're welcome all right namaste namaste